you're now listening to the Brandon Brand Sports Podcast. Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 42 of the Brandon Brand Sports Podcast. Uh, unfortunately, as we are wont to do, we are going to lead off with the Flames. However, the Flames are no... Do they deserve no- it, though? Do they deserve it? Probably not. They don't deserve to be in the playoffs, which they're not at all. After a absolute shellacking by the Dallas Stars in the final game, game six by a score of seven to three, all I can say is, holy shit, that was embarrassing. That was just a wow. Just a wow. Like, I, I'm at a loss for words. I mean, I called the score midway through. I mean, I'm not going to brag, but that was pretty impressive. I'm going to toot my own horn. I, I can send out that text if anyone actually wants it, because I still have it. It is quite impressive. <laughs> I mean, I didn't call it when it was 3 nothing. I When it went to 3-3, three, three, I could feel the bleeding starting, and I did not see any clotting happening. It was, it was just a train wreck that was just piling up and piling up, and it just led to a 7 straight goal performance by the stars after a three nothing lead that they spotted the flames five minutes in or so i have never seen a collapse like that before it was actually a a historic collapse is what it was no team in the playoffs had ever been up three goals and then down by four goals so that's the first time that's ever happened in the playoffs before yeah and i mean the turning point for me, I mean, obviously, was that Lucic penalty. Actually, two penalties, which the Dallas Stars scored on with his delay of game. But that first one, when he just skated in, kind of nudged the guy, he fell over the goalie. Like, I was debating this with another buddy, like, whether that was a smart or dumb move. I mean, Lucic does that all the time. The guy stumbled, but he fell over the goalie. I just felt like that didn't have to happen. The guy wasn't engaging Lucic. He had kind of had his back turned, like... That was kind of the the starting point of the collapse, but either way, that one point, I don't know if you can draw it to one thing. The Flames were going to lose this series. They stayed competitive, mainly because of Cam Talbot. I would say he was their MVP throughout the two rounds that they played. I agree with that. I don't think that they ever had a chance against Dallas. Dallas is clearly the better team. The thing, too, that we should note, and I have been saying this since it happened, the pulling of Cam Talbot... Uh, and allowing David Rick to come in absolutely lost that game. Now, again, it was 3-3 at the time. I think Jeff Ward made a panic move, and I think that will ultimately cost him his job with the Flames because Riddick should have never come in. He, he should have never come in. He was, was coming in cold. In the game. There was no... He had no game action. They were still in it. They weren't down. I just don't understand in his head why he was doing that. Why not just call a timeout? Yeah. Why not just give him some space? I absolutely agree. If they would have went down 4-3 with Talbot in, maybe I can see why you would do that. You you can see the ships taking on water at that point. You're losing after being up 3-0. I could see it maybe then, but not at 3-3. I don't get like, it. Like, I don't understand. Now, I know Cam Talbot led in three goals on, like, eight shots. He wasn't on top of his game, but... Th- you look at every Cam Talbot goal in this, game, in this series, aside from maybe a few... Most weren't his fault. This team is just, they have so many mental breakdowns, turn the puck over incessantly. They don't look confident out there. Where's the faith in the guy, too? Like, he had been the star up to this point. Like Like I said, MVP. Maybe Kachuk, before he got injured, he was probably right there. He showed absolutely no faith in this goalie that essentially carried this team up to that point. Yeah, I I feel like if they were going to lose, Cam Talbot was going to allow all seven of those goals. Like, I I just don't understand the mindset, especially the elimination game. I I just don't get it, Jeff Ward. I I don't get it. Why were they so dominant in the first? They had completely controlled the game, and then as soon as that second started, they just forgot what they were doing. Absolutely, man. That first period, they clearly, from start to finish, dominated the Stars. Even after the five minutes or so that they scored their three, they controlled the play. Dallas didn't get a lot going. Dallas looked rattled, actually. Uh, Rick Bonus did t- take that time out. Seemed to settle them down a bit, but I think they got away with a few. The Flames could have scored another couple in that period. They just kept it turning Dallas over. They were swarming them. They, they were, were all swarming over them. them. I think it was that Lucic penalty there that they scored 3-1 to, to get it into the first intermission. And then as soon as the puck dropped in the second, it was just game over, man. It was just game over. It speaks a lot to the lack of intestinal fortitude of this group. And I guess the this question, goes back to last year, oh, yeah. years against the Ducks. Like. Yeah, the, the Colorado thing that we've been touting this entire time. 
the question is where to go from here because there's a lot of things you can do I know where you're going to go with the tree living thing. Uh, I'm going to say right away, too, and you've said this before, but I think Goudreau and Monaghan both need to go. I just, I, I, I think the team just needs to refocus. Who's your core? I don't think it's Johnny Goudreau and Sean Monaghan anymore. Nope. They've, they're clearly second-line guys. They're not top-tier players. They don't fit they, in with the identity of the team either. Well, they, sh- they, they just... It, it, the, it, the track record's there now. This is Johnny Gaudreau's sixth year. He just turned 27. He's no spring chicken anymore. He's proven who he is in the playoffs. I think he'd be a lovely support player for some team. It's just, I think it's over. that The era is over for, it, for these guys to be the top-line guys. It just hasn't worked. And they've shown consistently that they can't get the job done in the playoffs. Now, Gaudreau looked a little bit better in that first period. I think he did have a goal. He did have a goal, yeah. But, you know, Monaghan vanished again. And these Two are supposed to be... in the whole series for Monty, man. Yeah. Like, It's the opposite problem of Edmonton, where Edmonton has two guys doing everything and no secondary scoring. We have secondary scoring and two guys who are doing nothing. It's ridiculous. Yeah, Lindholm was a fucking shadow in that series, too. He, horrible. Look good against the Jets. Horrible against the Stars. I don't know if I'd be willing to cut bait on Lindholm quite yet. No, no, no. I think he's part of the core. I'm just saying he had a poor performance. It was a it's not like forwards. it's just one guy. That's all I'm trying to say. The forwards that were getting the job done were Dylan Dubé and... Toby Reader. Toby Reader and... Uh, Lucic had a bunch of points. Backland looked really good most of the series. Bennett was all over the place. Bennett was our top goal scorer. Yeah, all over the place as um, per usual. And I even liked the way that, you know, the limited minutes the fourth line got with Ryan and Jankowski. You know, they weren't, they weren't producing goals, but no one scored against them. Great on the penalty kill as well. You know, I think we did miss Travis Hamanick a little bit on the PK. You're not going to get many goals out of him, but... That, that was something that hurt us. You know, obviously Matthew Kachuk going out in game two that was didn't a killer. help Absolute us killer. at all. You know, if we had him, maybe those other games where we lost by slim margins, we got over the hump. But uh, who's to say we didn't do that? You know, we kind of got served uh, some of our own medicine after what we did to the Jets. They didn't play with their top players. We didn't play with our top players. So either way, the group that was out there... Showed some signs of being good, but like this team just can't put 60 minutes together. You go back to the regular season, it was always a slow start. So they kind of got over that in the playoffs, but then you got your lulls in the second period now instead, and they just can't go that full stretch. It's clear. I think what the organization needs to do is thorough evaluation from the coaches up to management figure out who should be there for the long term. Yeah. Because I like Jeff Ward, but I again, I think that whole Riddick thing just got him <laughs> pretty much guaranteed to the unemployment line, or at least relegated back to yeah, associate coach. That's what, that's, well, I think he's going to be a lovely assistant. He always has been. Always People has say been. Always a has lot been. of good things about Jeff Ward. He's just not cut out uh, for you know being a head coach, at least at this point in time in his career. Uh, that was pretty clear. That was a rookie move. In terms of restrict free agents, some UFAs, some RFAs, uh, Mangiapani deserves a contract. 100%. He's an RFA. Guys like Hamannick and Brody, I think we let them walk. Yep. Toby Reeder, I think, played himself into a contract. Agreed. You know, he's not going to get big money, but I think he's a valuable piece. That guy's got speed, and he proved it in the playoffs. He put his nose to the grindstone, three shorthanded goals. Guys like that, I mean, I can see those guys just walking away, like I said, I don't think the Flames should bother putting up money for Brody or Hamannick, especially with what they'll likely command in the open market. I still think Talbot, too, deserves a two-year. He's the other guy. He <sighs> deserves a contract full stop. This is assuming they don't make a big money pitch to Leonard, which I don't think they will. I don't think they need to. Talbot's, Talbot's good. a bargain. He's man. good enough. He Well, he, he showed it, man. It, he wasn't the issue. Let's be clear. He was not the issue in the series. In fact, he was our, our best player with Kachuk out. All right, let's move over to uh, the Columbus Blue Jackets who were eliminated by the Tampa Bay Lightning. Kind of a heartbreaking series for that team. But again, another one where they were just completely outmatched from the get-go. And if not for a superhuman performance by Eunice Corpusalo, they probably would have bowed out in four. I mean, I loved how they stayed competitive. I mean, they, they pushed Tampa. Tampa was clearly in the mindset, we've got to win this series after what happened last year. And they went out and got it. They're clearly the better team. They were last year, too. They had a hiccup. They had to lose that that series to kind of, you know, get in that mental space where you can't just go out there and cakewalk every team. 
especially from what the record-setting performance they had last year in the regular season. I think they kind of lulled themselves into convincing themselves that they were they could beat anybody on any given day with the same amount of effort they put in the regular season. That's just not the case. Did you notice how identical the series was to Arizona and Colorado too? Like it was basically watching the same games. Now, granted, it was more of a factor on the Colorado side because they made Arizona look like a bunch of children out there. Well, the Jackets didn't lose back-to-back 7-1 games. <laughs> 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 but uh, hey. they play kind of similar styles. Colorado's, I, I've been saying this for a while now. I mean, they look like a team that's on the verge, and they look like a team that's got some longevity, kind of similar to the mid-'90s avalanche with Sakic and Forsberg and all those guys. You're absolutely right. That At least the Blue Jackets stayed competitive, not managing very many shots. The Coyotes clearly did not deserve to be in the playoffs. Yeah, after game three, I think they won one game there. The last two games were just embarrassments, <laughs> yeah. man. It was clear they did not belong, at least against the Avalanche. I'm shocked that they dispatched with Nashville that good, too. Now, granted, Nashville was doing the same thing and pouring in shots. I, I think they just had better bounces go the guy Yeah, way. Kemper just had his way against Nashville. I don't think that Nashville played poorly. I think they played well enough to win, but you get that goalie that steals a couple games and it was a best of five. See you later. I think they would have put up a better fight than the Coyotes did against the Avalanche, but who's to say? Yeah, I mean, the Colorado Avalanche look virtually unstoppable right now. Like, Nazem Kadri, as if the Toronto Maple Leafs needed any more salt in their wound. <laughs> <laughs> Holy crap. What a valuable guy he is, man. Like, <laughs> man, he's tearing it up. I can't believe up. Toronto it up. let him go. Like For um, Tyson Berry, too, of, I think it was. Of, yeah, of all the guys that they could have shopped out of Toronto, Kadri was n- not on my list. And they I, they got cap crunched, though. He was one of the guys that were, they were always on his ass when he was there, too. He yeah. just like fell into well, that. I don't know. Well, I, you're right, though. I mean, the media in Toronto is ravenous. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if all the issues that continually get on TV for weeks on end after one incident are really all that big of a deal. Or are we just seeing it on TV too much? It's got because a grind at you, though. You know, having your name in the papers, getting some sort of scathing review every other goddamn day. Yeah. You'd, I mean, he was there for a number of years. You know how yeah. Toronto brings out the the worst in everyone? It really does. Like, remember like, when Phil Ke- He's a quiet dude. He goes about his business. Remember how fucking pissed he was in all the interviews all the time in Toronto? <laughs> like, he, would, he just like looks so just, dejected. Yeah, they, like, he Constantly. just got sick of it. <laughs> I think Kadri was kind of the same. We'll see how these young guys deal with it. But they're, the, the media scrutiny is going to be there all through the offseason now until we start the new season in whatever, December, January. <laughs> they're already talking about replacing Sheldon Keefe. Bruce Boudreaux rumored to be joining that team. So is that the talk as an associate fit. coach. Oh, just an associate coach. Yeah. So, well, with associates, it's different than assistant. With associate, it's basically like, oh. Co-coach? Yeah. It's, oh, like, you got to look over your shoulder because you make one mistake and you're gone. Which I don't think Sheldon Keefe is going to have a lot of leeway after what just happened. Perfect. Bring in Boudreaux, oh, man. man. A couple more first-round exits for you, T.O. Well, and not only that, but can you imagine the media circus? Bruce Boudreaux does not take any shit from media members, dude. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like, remember when Randy Carlyle was in Toronto? Oh, yeah. And they had the terrible teams? Every night, he was like, fuck off, all of you. <laughs> all of you. <laughs> it was like that same kind of Tortorella kind of era of, of trash talk. Bruce Boudreaux's right there. He will not take a bunch of those stupid questions He'll that see his face get all <laughs> old red and and puffy. Red. He gets more purple than Brock Lesnar does when he's <laughs> yeah. trying to fight. <laughs> Absolutely. Washington Capitals. Oh my God. Got eliminated by the New York Islanders. The revenge of Barry Trotz, as I was predicting on the last episode. I don't know if this is because the Islanders are so good or if the Washington Capitals just really didn't give a single fuck about being there. The Flames series against the Stars was embarrassing. I would put the Washington Capitals' performance right on par with that. Pretty embarrassing, feeble effort. They never really had a shot. I mean, they got, had a handful of goals in eight games. New York dictated the play, smothered them defensively. They just looked disinterested, like you said. I don't know if you know these guys didn't want to be there collectively and were just forced to go or what have you, but it didn't seem like their heart was in it. Even the round-robin games, they looked lethargic. That doesn't sound too far-fetched to me. I say there's the player collective, and like as the, the whole pause is going on, there was talk of the certain group of players that didn't want to go and do this. I bet it wasn't just certain players. It was probably large chunks of teams that didn't want to go 
and were trying to lobby not to go so I could get it. And that's exactly what that looked like because the Washington Capitals have way too much talent just to get stonewalled like that. And not to take away from the Islanders because they're obviously a good team. Trotz is getting the best out of everybody. Absolutely. JG Pajot, Bolivier, who the fuck are they? Yeah, Matty Barzell played pretty well. Defensively, though, the forecheck really ate away at the Washington Capitals over time. It started early and it didn't relent. So, and Semyon you know, Varlamov looks like a starting goalie again, too. Yeah. This is a guy who couldn't control a rebound for years. Yeah. Well, he played himself out of Washington when they had chances to win cups. Uh, played with Colorado for years. You know, no real top tier success, but. We'll see what happens in the next round. But, I mean, obviously, they, they took care of Washington with ease. It's got to feel good for Barry. <laughs> Absolutely. You could see his face, man. He had that shit-eating grin on his face. Oh, yeah. As soon as he popped off the bench to go yeah. do the handshake line, he was just, like, dusting the old uh, shoulder <laughs> off, straightening his tie, <laughs> puffing his chest out, just thinking about that sweet scotch that was going to hit his throat right after. Yeah, for love, sure. Love I mean, that, dude. I, I think it's it's great, though. I think you always have a chip on your shoulder when you go against your old team, especially the one that didn't really want you after you won the cup. Didn't want to give him the money. Didn't and, want to give him the money, which is absurd. Which is totally absurd. You got the best out of Etchkin in the playoffs for one year out of his multi-year career. That was the only year that they got them to focus and actually, you know, execute. The two years since, first round exits, pretty brutal. Kovalchuk didn't really do anything for them either, did he? <laughs> well, I think we'd be <laughs> foolish to think he would carry the team. I mean, he's a supplementary guy at this stage in his career, but he didn't do anything. Kuznetsov didn't do anything. Ovechkin didn't do anything. Oshi didn't do anything. John Carlson didn't do anything. Everyone didn't do anything. <laughs> it, it almost looked like they just wanted to get out of there quicker. Yeah, well, their wish came true. Came true. <laughs> did you catch the Matt Niskanen hit on uh, Brendan Gallagher? I did. Oh, that bloody chick. What would you think was, about that? I mean, it, it was definitely a cross check. Yeah. I mean, it's you say what you will about the hit. I mean, the, the damage was done. Gallagher won't play for the rest of the series, at least. So yeah. regardless if it's a penalty or regardless if it's a suspension, you may lose the guy that did it, but they're losing one of their best players. Yeah. So, and mission Brent, accomplished. Brendan Gallagher is the heart of that team. Now, he still played after he had his broken he, he, jaw. With a broken jaw, that tough bastard. That's totally, crazy. Man. I have to give tip my hat to him, man. I you like a guy like that, and he uh, that kid's got moxie. Yeah, he does. And <laughs> wow. He, he still plays his heart out, even though he knows he's on an inferior team most nights. He gives her shit every night. So they, I'd love to have a guy like that on my team. I know I've shit talked him before, but. That kind of turned the tides for me. I especially this Habs run. He's the heart and soul, and you know, Carey Price is there too. No, no question. Those two, but from an offensive standpoint, on the you know for forwards, he's the guy that makes that engine run if it does run. Because I mean, they've been shut out quite a few times in that series too. Now, interesting to note, uh, Niskanen only did get the one game. Elaine Vigneault was trying to spin it off as a hockey play that just kind of got misplaced because Niskanen is a shorter guy. Could be. I mean, what else is Vigneault going to say, though? <laughs> it looked like a cross-check to the face to yeah, me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, it looked like that to me, but if you're his coach, of course you're going to defend him, right? One thing that the Philadelphia Flyers knew they had to hone in on was Brandon Gallagher through this series. They knew that. That was the one consistent threat they'd face every night from Montreal. So, like I said, it could have been on purpose. It could have been strategized. It could have been whatever. But whatever it was, it's good for the Flyers. Who were up 2-1 to one last I looked. We'll see how that game goes tonight. <laughs> Toronto Raptors went up 3-0 today on the Brooklyn Nets by a fairly decent margin. I can't remember what the final score was. Lots. Uh, lots of points. Yeah, lots of points. Uh, <laughs> Siakam had himself a game. I think he had a triple-double or close to it. Van Vliet looking like just a hell of a player this Absolutely. year. Absolutely. He's been the con most consistent guy in this series. And, man, I was scared of my own shadow with Brooklyn. It doesn't look like the Raps are going to have much trouble with them at all. No, that's a sweep if no, I've ever seen it. They still got to finish him off in game four. But every night it's someone different. I mean, Van Fleet's been pretty consistently up there in terms of points. Serge Ibaka had a big game last game. Uh, Norman Powell had a game in conjunction with Van Fleet in game two. Lowry's, you know, captain consistent. They're taking the ball out of Marc Gasol's hands, making him focus on his defense. You're not a shooter out there, which is perfect. Running their offense to perfection and playing some really good D. 
Brooklyn doesn't have either of its two top guys with them now, too. No, I didn't realize Kyrie wasn't playing. So who else do they have outside of that? I was looking at that Chris roster. Chris like, is a pretty lovely player, but he's not going to beat the Raptors on his own. Dinwiddie's a pretty good player. Yeah, too. I know Dinwiddie. The NBA is a star league. You need your stars to play. Your teams are built around them. The, the 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 concepts offensively are built around them. If they're not there, you're in shambles. Well, we all knew Durant was going to be there. Why isn't Irving there? Was he injured too? I don't know what the story is on that. That I'm not sure of, which is pretty bad for us. But either yeah. way, well, he, I, he could have I been haven't been the... focusing on the first round so, so much, aside from watching the scores and stuff. I but think he might might have been one of the guys that opted out. I actually. think he did. Yeah. That would be a Kyrie thing to do. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, either way, the Raps are taking care of business, but lots of crazy good action, man. I mean, the Magic took game one against the Bucks, like they did against the Raptors last you year. Yusevich. Yep. Just uh, asserting some dominance there. The Bucks in Game 2 weren't taking any of that shit. Oh nah. my god, they came out uh, in a bloodthirsty way on that one. Nah, they weren't going to have that. Like I said, the Raptors had that little blip too, and they swept him after that. I think the Bucks will do the same. And the Bucks, you know, when they're playing at their best, it's hard to imagine someone beating them in seven, but it happened last year, so we'll see what happens. Pretty sad to see the Blazers. They, they won Game 1. We're up at the end of the first quarter yesterday and then got beat down by the lakers anthony davis and lebron james look like themselves the lakers collectively took care of business pretty easily the one game today that was insane was the jazz against the nuggets i think the jazz won by 37 points despite the uh, guarantee by charles barkley absolutely <laughs> i like the jazz at the beginning of the year i love that mike conley signing I thought they already had some good pieces in Gobert and Donovan Mitchell. I, I think they're a pretty good dark horse team, and good lord, Denver looks totally horrible. They're, they've been one of the top teams in the West the last couple of years, and they were knocking last year, losing in the second round. So I don't know what's happening. I guess the Jazz are pretty good, but I expect Denver to come back. Connolly had just gotten back tonight, too. Like, he hadn't been with the team up until now because yeah. he was taking care of uh, some family business. Yeah, and he was just <laughs> ripping threes, man. <laughs> oh, my God. The the funny part, too, if anyone didn't see it, that whole uh, barkley Shaq exchange during that game was uh, absolutely fantastic. In fact, their banter in general, I have to just speak highly of because they are two entertaining individuals who yeah. just love to razz each other. It, it's bantering, but it's also bickering. But it's <laughs> yeah. great how they did that. They're so chippy with each other. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, you're right. It, 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 it just showcases that only two people can talk to the, especially on the air, can talk to each other like that if they're unless they're friends for like two decades, three decades or something like that. So clearly... They're chummy, but uh, they get a little chippy on the air, which is freaking entertaining. Well, Shaq's got the Lakers on that series, and uh, Chuck's got the uh, the Blazers. So I'm leaning more towards Barkley on that one. However, Lillard did uh, fuck his finger up in the last game here. Yeah, I think it was dislocated. <clears throat> I think that's what it was. Uh, now, I don't know what the severity is on a injury like that for a basketball player, but I can't imagine it's going to make shooting very fun. Depends on what hand it on, it's on. If it's on a shooting hand, and I don't know the exact details, without Lillard, they're toast. They're, there's no question that they can't compete with the Lakers without their MVP. So I'm hoping he's okay and can still play or isn't hindered too, too much. You know, with a healthy Blazers team, I think they can give the Lakers a run for their money, especially in this year. Maybe not under uh, normal circumstances, but definitely in these weird times. I think it's anyone's NBA Finals this year. I'd rather see the underdog run. I, I like the Blazers. I'm really getting turned on to that team yeah, lately. Yeah, and I mean, the, the Mavericks won a game against the Clips the other night, too, so maybe that series stays pretty competitive. You know, who knows? But This is just the year for w weird playoffs across the board, huh? Well, we said that in the NHL, but it seems like everything's playing out as it should. I mean, Vancouver might be the anomaly in the West, but everyone else who's supposed to move on is moving on to the second round some of the some of the guys in the east the same thing washington being the anomaly there you know they're they're not going through but the top seeds are moving through this year even though at the beginning in the play-in games uh and the play-in round you know there was definitely some upsets but everything the universe is kind of as it should be in the nhl anyways but the nba still up for for debate uh the houston rockets went up 2-0 on the thunder uh the thunder is actually a team that i follow semi-frequently just because of the uh, the relation to the supersonics and i was kind of holding out hope that they're going to be kind of competitive with chris paul leading the team the rockets are making sure that that is not happening yeah i mean i think okc had a great year i did not expect much from them this year but a lot of their young stars rose under chris paul the, you know they made the playoffs but man houston's a good team 
I don't know if they're built to win the whole thing. And Westbrook's not even there. Yeah, but they but, still got a great team. James Harden can win games against teams like the Thunder in his sleep. You know, they're not a top tier team. I think where Houston runs into trouble is when they get up against like the top, top teams of the league. I don't know if they're quite there yet. I know a lot of people keep getting on that bandwagon, but every year it's the same thing with Houston. Disappointment, disappointment. But, you know, maybe one year they'll do it especially if Westbrook comes back, but they can beat teams like OKC. There's no doubt. With Chris Paul, despite the good job that he did with mentoring those guys, that's probably the sole purpose that he's there because the OKC, like they've got a lot of young guys with your uh, shy Gilgis Alexanders and uh, those of that ilk. I think that's really why he's there, but he seems to have taken an interest in actually doing that for that team as opposed to just moving over to another superstar-laden uh, group. Yep. I, I think Chris Paul relished this year. I don't know if he'll be up for it every single year until he retires, but he, I certainly think this did something for his career. He's getting up there. He was the mentor. He was the top dog in OKC. There's no question. So I think he enjoyed teaching those guys, enjoyed the ride. You know, they had some success where I don't think that even those guys expected themselves to have. Yeah, who knows what's, what the future holds for Chris Paul, but I think he enjoyed this year thoroughly. Did you know that he was one of the head guys who was the liaison between the league and the players and getting the bubble set up? Like he yeah, was, he's a big players association yeah, guy. Yeah, I had man. no idea. Like he is a, a head honcho over there. Yeah, he's a boss. I, like he's quite well respected around the league, from what I understand. And I, 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 I and I can tell the way he runs the court and runs a team. Like he ain't taking no shit. That's why I don't think it lasted very long with James Harden. Uh, yeah, and I, I guess mean, that makes sense. Yeah, right? and I think even the, his his time wore, wore short um, in the with the Clippers because. You know, I think he liked playing with those guys, but playing with talents like DeAndre Jordan and Blake Griffin, who had fat heads, I don't think it was going to last for an entire career, and it certainly didn't. You know, five years they did it, and then I think he got sick of it. The Minnesota Timberwolves have come away with the first overall. Now, you'll have to fill me in here. I don't know tons about the Timberwolves. They feel like they've been kind of floating in limbo for a number of years. For their existence. For their existence. I don't even really know who's up for the draft this year because we haven't heard the, the Zion-type name thrown around. Yeah, well, we didn't get March Madness. That's usually where I get, you know, real really dialed in with uh, the talent that's coming through. So even I'm a little in the dark. But, I mean, the, the, the Timberwolves are perpetually in the basement of the West um, you know, it looked like they were kind of building something when they drafted Andrew Wiggins, Carl Wiggins, Anthony Towns, yeah. but they shipped Wiggins out of there, got D'Angelo Russell in return, did end up getting the first pick here. But, uh, I mean, they had Carl Anthony Towns is only, what, four years removed from being the top overall pick. That didn't do anything for the Wolves. D'Angelo Russell, yeah, he can score the ball, but I don't know if he's that great of a player. I, just the foundation in Minnesota is never solid. I mean, it was with Kevin Garnett. But we're talking late '90s at this point. Like that's a long time ago. So it's probably safe and even to say, with them, like they were never super contenders. It kind of sounds like they're the Knicks of the uh, of the West in a lot of ways. Uh, well, I, I mean, if you're if we're looking at the last twenty year window, absolutely. I think the Timberwolves only have a handful of playoff appearances, and some of them were under Kevin Garnett in the early two thousands. So they just can never get it done. Players don't want to play in Minnesota either. I don't know if it's management, you know, the fact you're living in Minnesota. Uh, I have no idea, but, I mean, the other professional franchises don't have trouble attracting talent, like the Vikings or Wild or Minnesota Twins. Well, the Twins, I guess, don't usually attract too many free agents, but particularly the Timberwolves in the NBA, yeah, they just, they're always bad. Like, bad, bad. <laughs> The uh, CFL gets the plug pulled on the 2020 season, effectively being a no-go until next year, allegedly. I put this on there because usually with the cancellation stuff, we kind of just move on and be like, okay, whatever, you're not playing. However, this is significant because it could actually spell the end of the CFL as we know it. Nothing happened from now until they have to make an announcement. Yeah, they will probably have the, the probability of them folding will probably be pretty high but i don't think the canadian government is going to let that happen they've denied the money twice now i know they have in the past but i think when push comes to shove they'll probably help them the, the canadian government and the provincial governments have been helping a lot of companies a lot of things and this is this is a traditional thing in canada i mean the cfl is way older than the nfl 
I mean, the CFL is over 100 years old. And it's wildly popular. Here. It is wildly here. popular here in Canada. Absolutely. And I'm a fan. Uh, I'd be sad to see it go. So I think if it came down to it, some someone, if it's not the government's corporations, or someone is going to help. Personally, I think if we look at a full another year without fans, they're either going to have to look at doing a permanent Winnipeg bubble, which they came up with way too late, uh, or they they could be in big trouble. That's the way I look oh, at yeah. it. Oh yeah, I mean this is a one off. Someone might help. Some something may help, but they can't go two years, or else yeah, it's pretty much toasted. Uh, the Padres got a grand slam in an MLB record four straight games. That's insane, man. Is it? Well, I, like I don't, I don't know baseball stats. You have to fill me in on that one. Well, if you're talking MLB record, the MLB is like the oldest league on the continent. So if you're talking a record, like we're talking over a hundred years. So if that's never happened, that's a pretty impressive stat. Now you're gonna have to fill me in though. Like, what's a grand slam? Grand Slam is when the bases are loaded and the guy up at the plate jacks a home run, clears the bases, four oh, runs. I should have known that. That's, That's a Grand pathetic. Salami, man. Uh, gotcha. So four straight games. I mean, that happens with relative frequency in the MLB throughout a season, but not four straight games. That's impressive. And the Padres, man, talk about perennial suck faces. They are. Uh, <laughs> they look like they've got some talent on that team. I don't know if they'll do anything this year, but they look like... A team that's uh, an up-and-comer, that's for sure. Uh, the Blue Jays pulled off a doubleheader victory over the Philadelphia Phillies, uh, one being a fairly significant comeback. I think they were down seven, <laughs> seven, seven hits, runs. seven runs. Seven runs in seven the runs. first inning and came back to win it last night. So uh, now everyone's hyped up. They've, uh, they've had a good stretch of seven to ten days here. Pitching still looks a little suspect, but the offense is coming alive, and now everyone's talking about playoffs. Uh, if they even happen in the MLB. But, you know, kudos to the Jays. This is a rebuilding process. They're going to have these hot times. It's going to be a while until they're consistent. They're going to probably drop off here in, say, another couple of days, and we'll see a four- or five-game losing streak, which I don't want, but it's going to happen. Cincinnati Reds broadcaster Tom Brenneman, I don't know if you heard the clip on this. Uh, He was suspended uh, indefinitely for getting caught using an anti-gay slur on air. (laughs) Now, they were on I don't mean to laugh as in the the slur is funny. It's the fact that, you know, that that still that's happening like that happened. OK, no. So what what happened was they were on commercial break and he must not have known that they flicked the mic on because they were like getting back to the field and then they cut to his mic. He must have not got the introduction and you could just hear him say the fag capital of the, the state or something. And it like it cut in at that exact moment. Good lord, man. That's... Fuck. I, he deserves... He probably should get fired. Oh, that's so... Well, yeah. He's never going to put on a headset again. No. What, a, what was he talking about? And B, why would you be doing that in a work booth with your freaking headset Regardless on? of if you're on the air or not. On the, I know. I, like, and, I, I, and this I, I, isn't even a thing about getting caught. You shouldn't be saying that shit anyway. Yeah. But, like, that's brutal. Yeah, it's pretty bad, man. It was just the timing of it, too. You'll have to see the clip, because, like, it's kind of cartoony in the sense that it actually happened. But uh, well-deserved indefinite suspension and likely loss of job. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, Tiger Woods was 3-under-68 at TPC Boston. I think this is the start of the golf playoffs, although my uh, knowledge of golf playoffs is fairly slim at this the, point. The FedEx Cup, yeah. yeah. You know, Tiger Woods is a couple of years off of winning the Tour Championship in the in the FedEx Cup. He didn't win the FedEx Cup. He lost it by a couple of points because that Tour Championship gives you the line share of your points. But he, you know, didn't have a good regular season. But you know, he's, his experience in this thing is you know pretty good. Even going back into his glory days, he dominated. Again, though, the PGA Championship, he came out, you know, went under early and fell apart on the weekend. That's Tiger's. Achilles heel as he gets older is he can he can he can compete on Thursday and Friday make the cut but after moving day he just kind of fades away into obscurity and by Sunday afternoon they're not even showing him on TV anymore so I hope he does you know I always hope for the guy but I'm not overly optimistic but good work so far Anyways, boohoo, Flames lost, like, big time. We're still beside ourselves. But, you know, a little weight off our shoulders. We don't have to stress about games anymore. And 
uh, we'll see who comes out on top, but it looks like a lot of good hockey played here in the future. But until next time, don't be a dick on the internet. We'll talk to you next time.